Okay, going hot in five. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Man Talk Podcast. Today, we're talking about budgets. And the main reason why we're getting at it is this has been one of our side projects in our mid-20s, Julia and I here. And we're going to get involved with some of the deeper examples of budgeting. And I'm really looking forward to it today. Um, today, before we get into those particular examples, we're going to start with some of our philosophies on budgeting and how we got there. So kind of allude to the significance of what we're going to do today. So I'll start with what happened with me. So at first, I really didn't care that much about budgeting because at 22 and back, I'm a dependent human being. I'm broke every time. I'm focused more on getting through school. That's not even on my to-do list. That's so far down, I could probably push that back five years. And sure enough, it got pushed back about five years. At 23, my life changed a lot with changing different jobs. So again, not really on my priority list. I'm just glad I can pay the bills still in my new jobs, um, both in California and North Dakota. But then as year after year happened, 2016 happened, 2017 happened, some of those um, things that were in the way of in my life, as far as side projects, budgeting started to come up. And the main reason was, crap, it's not just about saving, it's how to save. Why are we saving? Where's my money going to go in five years? Instead of, I'm saving for the next year so I can have my six months worth of expenses taken care of, like Dave Ramsey says. Um, but... Once you get a lot of those questions answered in those first couple of years of saving and you really have something to, to keep, you really start considering, well, where should I be putting it? And to what extent do I need to save? That big question isn't really answered in college and this is something we have to figure out for ourselves. So for me at about 25, 26, I was going, I need to have a budget of my own. And my folks didn't show me how to do it. They did save, but they didn't say how or why. So I do dove into it and I talked to a couple friends of mine, uh, Alex being one of them over in the Bay Area. And he's a friend of mine from college. And I'm going, hey, how do you do it? You, you just bought a home. You've got a wife. You've got a, a wide, varied amount of expenses. How do you keep track of it? And he told me about his budget and I gave it a try in 2018. And I realized how off I was. The first year I tried it on Excel, which I thought I was smart, I wasn't. In about one year, I found out I was nine grand over my planned budget. And I'm going, huh, how come that happened? I thought I was smart. I thought I was disciplined in, in the way I spend. So then I talked to him again, and I saw the flaws in a lot of how I made my budget on Excel. And he's showing me how he itemizes ex his expenses, how he removes as much contingency in his budget as possible. So he defines every single expense before it happens. He was talking about uh, getting involved with discussing it with his wife and his family and his friends. He made it part of his life more than just on an Excel sheet. He made it active. And those concepts were so important for me that I implemented them in 2019 into my budget and now it actually can function. The second iteration worked and I was so happy about it. Um, I wanted to share it um, with some fake numbers, of course, and at least show you how it works. Julian's got a budget as well and I want to let him have the show for a little bit so he can talk about his philosophies and his budget. Yeah, so post-university, post-graduation, uh, I found myself with a new career, new job, all this money coming in. And fortunately, no debts. Um, my parents are very grateful or very um, hospitable, I guess, to pay for my college. So right off the bat, I didn't have any debts and I could just focus on savings. Budgeting, per se, just like itemizing or getting a holistic overview of my expenses didn't really happen my first couple years outside of college. So I just had a very rough estimate, mental estimate of how much I was spending and how much what I was saving. 
And that was okay because for me at that time, I wasn't making that much money. But as soon as I started making significantly more income, I was like, oh, I should actually be more targeted about how I'm maximizing my income and how I'm minimizing my expenses. Because one of the dangerous things you can have if you're just, well, spending money willy-nilly is lifestyle creep. And at least for me, lifestyle creep can and has become a problem where it's just like, oh, I need to eat out like every day and then have this amount of money and have this amount of resources. And it's like, well, that can only last so long until you start having like 30 meal, $30 a day spent on food for a month and that's $600. And then you're outside of your budget basically. So around 2018 as well, actually, about three years post-graduation, I was like, okay, now I'm making enough money where I should really buckle down and really focus my energies on, okay, how can I maximize my money so it benefits me? And I developed a very cursory general overview sort of budget that focuses on the month to month and less the itemized expenses. Um, and for the most part, being it being 2020, if I want to look at every single item that I purchase, I can look at my bank statements and draw graphs with online resources or resources at my disposal, specifically Mint, which is an Intuit uh, software that tracks all the expenses and plots graphs. Uh, for me, my personal philosophy isn't so much to get into the minutia, but just to have the general larger scope budgeting. But we'll go over that in the, our differences between Jacob and my philosophy. So uh, Jacob, can you, let's go ahead and share your budget and see what you're doing and what your uh, strategies are. Very good. We're going to get away from the Discord side by side for a little bit. Um, so if that's okay, um, I can share my screen so that way you can still see on your end, Julian. And I'll go through exactly how to get into it and go from there. So stand by. Great. Sounds good. So share screen. So Julian, you should be seeing it. Um, I'm going to zoom in because I remember during our pre-planning, it didn't um, get to the right font. So I'll make sure it's zoomed in for everyone. Um, yep. I'm currently opening up the template bill summary. So after entering your password um, to your absolutely protected confidential information, you're going to notice five tabs. So five tabs here, each one's got a purpose. So the budget tab is all about design. So how are you going to design this year? For that way, being able to save up for what you need for getting a proper savings rate and for getting all of your expenses mapped out um, before they actually happen. So you can see that it's based on two weeks, a month, and a year for columns B through D. It covers all the income on the top five rows there. And then for the rest of the rows, eight through 30, you're seeing the housing expenses, the gas expenses, life investments, utilities, and eventually the totals for all of those on row 32. Right. Once you get on down here, um, this is the, the real interesting part. This is the dollars per year, the after-tax income that you saved, the total expenses, and then how much savings afterwards. This is the actual money that you get to keep along with the savings rate per every dollar that you were able to actually get before taxes. So again, this is all about design and its intention is to get you to think about how much is what I need to account for all of my expenses throughout the year. In the next tab, you're going to notice it's about uh, totalizing all of those expenses line by line. So don't be 
uh, alarmed by how many expenses there are, you'd be surprised how many expenses someone has in a year. These are all fake, um, but it gives you an idea of how many expenses you have just throughout the year living on a $36,000 a year uh, salary, for example. So there being credit cards to uh, what's going on in the checking account to the total amount of money you had to put in for all of your paychecks, et cetera. And it goes down by the item number, the date in which you did the expense and what expense type it was. Was it utility? Was it for gas? Was it for electricity? And all of these are going to be auto populated in the next tab. But the main point of this is for accountability. You're seeing every dollar you make go in and every C, every dollar that's going to be leaving to a particular expense type. So that's the objective. On the next tab, you're going to see just all the totals. So this is going to be for the graphs. You want to get an idea of how well you're doing and you want to see the visuals. So that's the point of this bills summary tab. The expenses down here on column C, you get to see the expense type and how much is left, which is the Delta B and the total expenses, which is everything that's already been spent on throughout the year. And I like what you said, Julian, you said spending $600 a month on food. Well, it's just coincidence, but I put food as a negative uh, ex expense type here. That means we went over $716. So, and same with gas for all those travelers out there. So if you understand how much you're normally going to spend, it really helps so you can figure out how much you really should be spending for your lifestyle. Julian made a good comment about co uh, lifestyle creep and how that's going to show up as your life uh, keeps going. We'll talk more about that after this uh, budget template. Moving down the line to trends, the whole point of this is to see the expected expenses on a graph in comparison to your total spending. That's it. That's the whole point. So I can see by month, um, the from month one to month 12, or just seeing the difference between one the beginning of month one and the end of month one, which is January between one and two in December, 12 through 13 on the X axis. That's the whole point. Moving down the line here to the itemized spending, you get to see every single expense on a bar graph. So this helps you uh, visualize what's going on. And I know Julie and I talked about this earlier, one's not checked, but if I check housing, you'll notice everything's really small now. So what you're gonna wanna do is uncheck it so you can actually compare your expenses graphically and not just stare at that giant housing uh, bar graph instead, because that's not very helpful. On the final tab, there's a README and it explains every single uh, type of expense itemized by row and defining every single piece for the design. So that way you understand why the money's going where it's going. And it takes some practice, but with a little bit of practice, you can effectively put the money where it should be instead of trying to merge categories, which was my biggest mistake in 2018 with my first budget. I couldn't keep them different, uh, differentiated rather. So I had to get more granular in order to get to where I needed to be, where my budget would make sense. And that helped me stay accountable. So that's the end though. It's all about the accountability of the user, the design of the budget, being able to track your expenses and see how well you're doing. All of that's within this summary. So thanks for watching on this one. I know that was quite a lot. So Julian, uh, I'll let you take it from here on your budget when you're ready. Sure. Okay, I'll just dive right in. Um, so for my budget, it's a month-to-month -month general overview. It's not itemized, but despite it not being itemized, it gives a rough, rough estimates of what I expect my general costs per month will be for larger categories. So in this example, I have my housing rent, car insurance, phone, what have you. And then if I know those amounts, I can spread that across a 12-month period from January to December. 
and tweak those in case things change, especially with the gas, because gas won't be perfectly 200, but the budget calls out 200. If we go all the way to the right, we can see the totals for the entire year, as well as for each of the expenses. So obviously rent has the most. And then we can also see the totals across all of the months. So each month will show the expected expenditures. So in this case, it's rent, car insurance, phone, what have you. And then the question that someone with this amount of expenses each month, each month will, will ask themselves is, is this within my budget? If we go over to this column, these columns, and look at the actual budget for this person, their monthly salary income is 6000 this information is taken directly from the hypothetical paycheck that they would take. They would call out the salary, all the deductibles, all the taxes, withholdings, what have you, and then the actual taxes along with a tax rate that you yourself can calculate the sum of these taxes, right? And you get a total gross, which is here and here, and where all that money is going to the state and the feds. And then you can also calculate the total savings per year. Now, in this case, that value deducts the 401k amount from it. So if you wanted to include that as well, you can account for that in more formula down here and see what your actual total savings rate would be if you include your pre-tax deductions. So if we look in this example, we see that 1538 again, that was over here. And we can see the yearly take home without the 401k contribution. And you can see that in this example, the budgets look decent because you can see the expense or savings ratio, it's about 50-50. In my own personal income, because these are dummy numbers, I have a ratio that's closer to 70, 75% savings. And I use a similar Excel sheet that just lays all this information out and then figures out, oh, how can I split the pot of the remaining money, which is this value, remaining after expenses into different additional savings accounts. So my general philosophy isn't necessarily in the itemization of each expense, but just in the general target goals, which could be summarized here, the expense ratio and the savings ratios, which is just simple, uh, in this case, division. And again, my general philosophy is just to get to that percentage point without necessarily um, worrying too much about the details. As long as I'm within the budget, if my savings are where that I want them to be, then I'll be, in my case, a happy camper. If I had a very bad spending problem and I just had no idea where all my expenses were going, then I would probably buckle down and get the self-discipline to use Jacob's budget, for example. Um, but it really depends on the person and the temperament and their savings goals and the outcomes that the person's looking forward to. Like, oh, do you need to save for a house? Do you need to save for a car expense? How about a family, right? All of those should be incorporated, obviously, into your budget and accounted for in a realistic way relative to your income. So say you're not taking 6000 a month in each month then you have to reassess your budget to make it more real, realistic to your, your actual goals. And that 1500 a month may just mean you're scraping by. So you might have to cut down on your food or cut down on your rent expenses, find someplace cheaper to live. So again, it's ultimately dependent on 
what your circumstance is. So knowing that the budget itself is going to need to change on the design for each individual person. Um, and depending on what their value is, their budget needs to reflect that. So it, we're not trying to get at that one budget's going to be good for everybody. It's just you need to budget and make a design that works for you. Um, in our case, we did something that works for us. Um, and I actually agree with Julian's method, especially for starting out. Maybe having too much of a complicated budget doesn't make sense to do when you're first, let's say in your first couple of years of work. You kind of just want to have an idea of where it's going, but not everything. Maybe the primary expenses. And then as you get older and you want to see the secondary expenses so you can get a little more optimized, then go with the method I suggested. Um, I appreciated right, but... mine just because that gave me the accountability and the security that I've always wanted in a budget. So go ahead, Julie. Right. Also, itemization is a powerful tool to rein in exorbitant expenses that are unaccounted for. Like if you have a sweet tooth and you're just buying a coffee or boba every day for the whole year, you can do a quick mental map uh, math to account for that expense. Okay, four bucks a day, 30 days a month, 120 a month, uh, it's over 1200 a year, even more than that. So it's like, wow, that's a lot on sweet drinks. But until you itemize it, it could be difficult to see that that's actually occurring. And that expense really adds up over time. So itemization was the big thing I wasn't doing in 2018. But Julian actually mentioned something that I didn't say about my budget. So another pitfall was that first year of, well, I'm just gonna change what my budget design is um, six months into the year. If you do that enough, you may get an inaccurate budget. And what I mean by that is, you're not really seeing what you're designing. Are you just putting in the numbers that you're spending? Or are you actually following the design and the discipline that you planned out for in January? So there is that give and take there that needs to be considered. But if you're changing it every month just to match your expenses, it's not exactly what I'd call an optimized budget. It's more just, oh, I just have to account for this expense here and call it. So keep that in mind when making a budget so you're not cheating yourself in trying to maintain your savings. Because everybody out there with some kind of business in the private sector is probably interested in finding a way to get your dollars into their pocket. So it's hard. It, you can't always do that. Um, but when you can and take initiative, you might be able to save quite a bit of money. So that's the whole point of this, this budget a podcast. So Julian, where did you want to go now that we've actually talked about our own examples um, now that we've gotten that out of the way? I'm kind of curious to learn more about how you specifically have budgeted for housing as an example, because that's an extremely expensive uh, undertaking. So you have to be either quite rich or qu quite a uh, budget uh, conscious in order to save enough in a reasonable amount of time frame just to have the, the base baseline amount that you need to put a down payment for a house. So I'm curious how you went about that process and what steps uh, you'd recommend to listeners to do it themselves as well? Great question. So housing is my number one expense and it may remain that way the rest of my life. Here's how to get, get it down, at least especially when you're starting out at work, you're gonna wanna hear this one. Getting a roommate, like what Julian's doing, is exactly what I did when I was getting my first uh, job or two. That cuts down the housing a lot. And just from doing that already puts you on a different playing field for savings. You really should consider that as an option. Probably the easiest way to do it. Um, granted, if you can't do that, there are other options. For me, I decided to maximize my first three years, not only on the roommate situation that would get that housing down, but that also gets the utilities down because it's a shared household. 
The next thing I decided was travel is not going to matter as much. I need to take my personal life and make it a little more boring in that regard so I can save a little more, especially since the house that I would like to have for, let's say, 20 years is going to outweigh some of those, uh, let's say, superficial experiences going to a trip overseas again on my own dime. So I, I did something there. Um, I also maximized the value that I wanted to have while I was still waiting for my savings to go up. So invest in some hobbies that you're actually going to be doing while you're waiting that don't have to be a lot of money. In, in my case, video games are part of it, but that's not all of it. We, the, the podcast has been part of it, but also not all of it. So I was an avid swimmer and still am. I made sure to have a gym membership for it when I first got back. And in Davis, it actually wasn't that expensive. It was only like $350 a year, and that included the ARC, so that was a pretty big win. Um, I decided that while I was in town, I would like to go on a bike ride instead of uh, driving somewhere to see a friend in, on the other side of town. I did that more often and saved a little bit more on gas. So taking the, those initiatives helped maintain where my money was gonna go. and. Granted, I can't use the same strategies now that I've moved away from that, that city. But I would say while I was there, I made the best of it. And a lot of it, a lot of times for your budget, that really is it. You're just trying to make the best of your situation and minimize the things that can be expended so that way you can actually have value later. Um, other than that, th it wasn't really rocket science. It was just being disciplined with I know I can't spend that much money for a trip that's not going to matter that much. I'd rather have that saved for a house that I'm actually going to use later in life that would be way more useful for me. Um, what about you, Julian? What, what saving strategies do you have in mind? So for housing specifically, since it's such a big expenditure, it would have to be, in my case, uh, well, basically a cost reduction across the board. So what I do is I don't have a brand new car. I have a used but reliable car, which is significantly cheaper to run. What I'm looking into specifically for my own case is to find something that gets good fuel economy and has low maintenance. And you can find that within a car that's come out in the last 10 years that's less than ten thousand dollars there's actually uh, an auction put up by the state to sell off old vehicles that i've been meaning to go to to look for cars that are otherwise perfectly fine used government cars but are significantly discounted just because the state has to get them off their hands also finding used car vendors who are reliable based off of reviews and your own personal experience you know, testing the waters, talking to them can be invaluable. Uh, that's how I got my last car, which was less than five grand. And it's been very reliable and fairly cheap to run, even if it is kind of a gas guzzler. And then on, you already mentioned the, the renting front, the housing uh, cost expenditure front. Don't live in an extremely expensive place relative to your money because that will eat up a lot of your savings. So if you live with housemates, especially in your 20s, that's fairly normal and nothing to be, you know, upset about. So if you could cut that house renting housing expense in half from 850 to say somewhere in the 400s, you're saving a significant amount of money that could be better geared towards investments, making more money return and say the uh, a CD or the stock market. Additional ways to save money, just have a cheaper phone plan instead of paying like 120 a month for uh, one phone plan, you can gauge, okay, which service provider has basically 95% of what I need, but the most economical amount. And it doesn't have to be Sprint. It doesn't have to be AT&T uh, or Verizon. It could be like T-Mobile, Met Metro PCS, or even a track phone if you don't even use your phone for, for calling. 
Um, but the main goal there isn't to compromise your ability to use your phone. It's just to save where you need to save in terms of unnecessary expenses, right? And then similarly, every single part of your life can basically be attributed to, okay, do I really need to eat out daily or could I buy the food and cook for myself, right? And then doing the cost breakdown of, oh, eating out daily, like $20 a day versus buying food for the week, maybe $50 a week, right? I'm looking it's forward like, to jump in on that because food for me is my number three expense. So right. walking down the line from housing, being able to get your groceries in a reliable store that isn't jacking up the price like crazy, great idea. Um, and this goes with the memberships uh, row as well. Costco, I'm a big pro Costco guy. And the main reason for is the economies of scale. You can buy things in bulk, it's for real. So you're not buying the up priced one to three rolls of, uh, let's say, paper towels, you're getting 10 to 15 of them. And that's really useful because then that's already dealt with. Cool, I've got paper towels for days. Uh, I don't have to buy it again for five years, let's say. Uh, and then with other foods, as far as Costco, being able to get just, let's say, five pounds of chicken uh, in bulk, that's a really good idea if you can have the, the freezer space for it. If you can't and you're in a roommate situation, that's a great idea to start splitting up the grocery bill among the roommates, and now it's not a big deal. And we used to do that. We used to do one person would have the Costco membership, and then everybody else would hightail and go to Costco, and we'd all buy our, our separate items and split it from there. So it was really useful for us uh, to save a fair amount of money that way. And I actually shop there exclusively for groceries just because of how useful it is. It's rather convenient and economical. But the flip side is, because you are buying in bulk, there is a tendency for them to exploit that in the grocery mindset where you're just buying everything you can see because you think it's such a great value. It's a mistake to put cost and value to mix them up like that. These are consumable items. So budget for it and then it won't be a problem. And grocery lists are good for that. I keep a menu myself for what I make within my own home so that way I understand what I'm gonna buy every time I go to the store. It's more about refilling than it is about expanding my pantry, which is what a lot of people do. And then when they do that and they can't eat all of it because they've been eating out all the time because they wanted to have the best of both worlds, all of a sudden they're throwing food away and they're wasting space from their roommates and causing trouble in that regard. So with food, I highly recommend Costco. There are other options. Um, but that's worked for me and just being able to maximize the economies of scale and having a disciplined list really helps with maintaining that. Um, what do you think, Julian? Yeah, Costco is a great resource in place to just improve your economy of scale, but also to save on, well, weekly items that you're going to consume anyways. And you can spread out that cost across the week or your monthly budget. So it makes perfect sense. In addition to just inhibiting your expenses on, say, eating out all the time, what you can do as well is just take a very frank assessment of what your actual income is versus what your expenses are relative to your debts, right? Like, no one wants to be in perpetual debt when it comes down to it. And you could see yourself in that if you have interest rate creep which is just eating away and eating away at whatever debts you may have, especially if you have a high interest rate on like a credit card, something like a 22% interest. That's insane. An alternative to that would be just, well, one, the obvious don't get credit card debt, but that's not always possible. But more importantly, if you're going to have to resort to that to come up with an action plan in order to get that, paid off as quickly as possible. This goes for all debts, really, from student loan debts to credit card debts 
to auto loan debts, whatever. It doesn't necessarily matter what the debt is. It's just the strategies are going to have to be pretty, you have to be pretty on top of it, especially for student loan debts, for example. If you're only pay, paying off the minimum, that loan is going to cost a lot more over the life of you paying it off than you probably ever used out of it when you're in college. Um, I know from most of my peers who graduated with very uh, job profitable degrees, most of them have already paid off their student loans and they, those weren't cheap necessarily. They had maybe 30 to $60,000 in loans, but they had a career and a payment plan in mind for once they graduated to just pay those off and not be burdened with that. And that way they could focus what's uh, the most important thing once you have the finances to do it, which is savings. Ultimately, saving for whatever your, your more important goals are, which isn't just getting out of debt. And our examples we've given tonight, retirement, cars, houses. And I would make the case, actually, that to disagree a little bit, that sometimes uh, experiences are worth the expenditure. Like say you go international, travel overseas. It may not be the best option if you're saving for a house, but a specific experience that's overseas could be extremely valuable and then tweaking your mindset in a certain way, at least in my case, to speak from personal experience. Uh, my trips overseas always give me a, a new perspective on how other communities around the world live. And that's really hard for me to get in my my dungeon, in my house down in uh, Davis. Uh, so personally, whenever I've gone overseas or even interstate, right, just in California, uh, I feel as though I've learned a lot about myself and a lot about Oh, what I could become, seeing other people like function or other societies function. Um, so that specific critique is more geared towards, oh, well, what is the purpose of your money? Is it just something you hoard or is it something that's buying you material objects? Or is it something that's buying you experiences? Ultimately, that's going to be person dependent and it's up to you to figure out, okay, do I want to pay for experiences, uh, objects, or have no idea, which wouldn't be a great, uh, great option. Well, again, it depends on the person, right? And because people value different things or experiences, that's going to depend on, on whoever is going to be budgeting. Um, and that's fine, but... Keep, I would recommend that material things shouldn't take all of it and neither would, or travel or just yourself. Really, what I see the, the point of budgeting is you're being responsible with everything you've worked so hard for and then putting it towards something that is going to go in a direction that you would want and then that what society would want. So in the case of uh, us, it would be the cultivation of making wherever we're at better because we can actually get to stick around. We actually have a house instead of just an apartment where we have to keep moving every so often when the rent prices go too high, being able to actually have a place to call home and being able to invest in the community. So in my case, that's really what was the higher value in everything. Right. That way my life has a direction on my personal side versus just having money for going around the world or going to do something temporary. I, I saw it as trying to get it set up for a life where it's really uh, grounded in, in some kind of rooted domain. So, but everyone else it may not be able to do that. Maybe there is something that requires traveling. I know there's plenty of people who are out there. I was right there with them at 22. You're traveling for a living because that's right. where the, the work will travel. So the house thing has to be put on the on the fence for now yep yeah it's just uh it it's a philo philosophical uh perceptional thing at that point 
And so what other stumbling blocks did you have with, with your budgets though? It, I'm curious to see what other, other things happened to you. So in my circumstance, the, I should have started earlier on saving for retirement. Uh, I had put some money towards specifically retirement, but what I should have done as soon as I graduated um, college was maximize the contributions to 401ks uh, and Roth IRAs, traditional IRAs, and postpone like any immediate gratification buying stuff that I bought at the time. Because at the end of the day, the material objects don't necessarily improve your holistic well-being necessarily. They're just nice things to have, but they're also things you can live without. Whereas you can't really live without a retirement fund, at least not. Um, yeah, you can. You just got to keep working. Yeah. Which is the, at least, that's the caveat. Yeah. Like as much as I would love to keep working to work in my 60s, I would much rather work because I would want to work, I guess is a way of phrasing it. So having a jump start right out of college on the retirement fund, I would have improved or started differently. And then potentially just starting right off the bat out of college with higher income. So instead of doing the research route that I've chosen to do for my own personal reasons, maybe go get that baseline salary right off the get right out the gate so that I can meet my targeted goals sooner. But in trading that short-term financial prosperity, I've gained a significant amount of experience so that when I, I eventually do leave the research environment, I would become a pretty invaluable employee to whatever company or state agency I'd work for. So although the temporary pay cut is not the greatest thing in the world, I am more than fine with it because of what opportunities and knowledge I've gleaned from uh, my current work. I see. So really it's been a lot of the initial condition choices you, you took for getting into the workforce. Um, and not being able to put together like a Roth IRA real quick. Um, yeah, and that's something that people that I work with that are older keep saying that, man, I wish I did blank. And then they keep saying, I wish I should have started my investments earlier. What was I doing? What was I thinking? Uh, it's, but it's hard to think about that. You know, it's, it, to everyone's credit, Roth IRAs didn't really exist until like, what, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago. Yeah. It wasn't that long ago. They're kind of an abstract concept. They don't really mean anything until you actually get to see the fruit of your labor or someone else's labor. And if you don't see that, it's real easy to think, I don't need that right now because you don't really need that right now. If anything, it's kind of a money sink. So it's not clear that it's actually going to pay off in the end until you actually start seeing it in your old age. Um, so I could see why people do put it off, but because there is such a good personal finance movement going on um, within the modern day, which I think is amazing that that's actually, <laughs> it's still standing there. It's still standing throughout all of this crap in modern day. People are still thinking about it enough where they want to get involved. And that's actually why I like Reddit, uh, Reddit's personal finance page. They've got so many good outlets for Roth IRAs and being able to save up for a house. And their advice is probably better than the podcast we're giving, but we at least gave some examples that would help uh, be a supplement to what they're giving. And what right. people like Dave Ramsey are giving on his seven, seven baby steps on getting, getting to financial health with getting out of debt, usually with the high interest, knocking that out, making sure you got six months worth of expenses ready to go in the bank at your, you know, the, at the drop of a hat, being able to have your investments ready to go on putting in and maxing out your Roth IRA, 
And eventually, the, the seventh baby step isn't about you anymore. It's you can give away what you need to people who do need it as in terms of generosity. So that's the eventual goal I would like to have. So it's not a function of taking care of me so much. Now it's I've taken care of myself in a way where I can take care of more than one person with with the funds that I make. And I think that's really useful. Right. Do you, do you have any uh, opinion on the accountability aspect, right? The guilt aspect that having your personal income versus how you itemize the, the money and spend it? Sure. So there is a thing of over budgeting, which is something we haven't covered yet. Um, over budgeting is where you're not putting money towards something to take care of yourself. So that way, when you do get to some level of financial independence, you have you still are you. Um, so this is something I've also discovered um, going through in my mid twenties. I first was trying to budget so hard, and then I'd fail, and then I'd get feel guilty about it. Failure is part of the budgeting process. The key is, as we've talked about prior, is iteration, being able to eventually get to the right answer. But we'll have to iterate again as time changes. The food and housing markets are always changing and usually going up. So we eventually need to fork over a little more money towards that. Maybe we need to, instead of purchasing gas in terms of that budget, we need to start thinking about the electronic uh, budget for maybe a new car that runs only on electricity. But what I'm getting at here is it's hard to be accountable if you don't have friends or people that you hang out with that are doing the same. Uh, with that said, if you've got people that really don't care about saving money and you're hanging out with them all the time, you are gonna get some of their ideas in your head unless you're extremely disagreeable and or strong-willed, one or the other. And with that uh, in mind, we need to be considerate that who you hang out with and who you're accountable to matters just as much as the budget you made. Yep. Definitely. With uh, your environment, specifically for financial budgeting, if you're around a bunch of loose spenders, then as you said, you'll be more likely just to blow off your budget and then just find yourself in this rabbit hole of debt. But if you surround yourself with people, individuals who are, well, help, trying to get a house, trying to plan for the future, family, retirements, and you'll be more inclined to see the value of the money as well if that wasn't already apparent to you. Same with your family too. If your family is more uh, budget conscious and really um, gets into the weeds with, okay, well, the reason why we're not having the heater on all night and just having just part of the night for heating expenses because those add up over time and we need to be mindful of how we're consuming resources because every consumption comes at a cost it just doesn't grow off of a money tree even though money can relate to trees but that's another story yeah it's the cumulative effect every choice you make is going to have some level of cost so what sacrifice here's a bigger question what sacrifices are we willing to accept for the sake of maintaining the budget? Right. And for the vast majority of people, at least from the statistics that we've looked at, the amount of sac individual sacrifice people are willing to do is not as high as maybe it should be, but it's hard to quantify in real numbers why that may be. Maybe it's the environment, maybe it's our culture, maybe it's just individual temperament, who knows, but that would be di diving into speculation land. And that's, well, you could speculate endlessly, you know? Uh, analysis paralysis. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That, exactly. That's one of those things. Unless you wanted to itemize it for another time and eventually get all of those factors in play. I know it depends on the region for right. sure. And it depends on, on why people would val value one thing or another. 
um, especially in a big city. If you're in a big city, you're not caring about housing that much. You really aren't. It's it's more of the present day. Um, because experience of living in a city sometimes too, like those who choose to live in SF or New York. And the experience to them matters more than the housing costs. And then it matters more to them than just buying a house. So they put that on the back burner because, well, how the heck are you supposed to get a house in a city like that? Or even in the suburbs, it's rather expensive. And correct. And even in the world scheme of things, trying to get into the suburbs, while living in the city and having that lifestyle, it's just not going to happen unless you do something about it or have a really good salary. So it's something to weigh in the balances um, when budgeting. Right, exactly. I think we touched on most of the topics we wanted to cover. Is there any final thoughts you want to add, Jay? Yeah, again, the budgeting, it's not about, it's not about this is a budget for everybody. This is a budget for getting your accounts ready for whatever you're going to do in life and have the money that you made not control your life, but you control your money. And that way it doesn't just affect your life. It affects your family life. It affects the friends that you hang out with and invest in and where your life's going to go. It, it's really about life direction. And if you can't get your, your money straight as far as direction, how, how are you supposed to get a life that you actually want to live? Uh, there's so many people out there that they are actually do budget, but they didn't get to have a lot of good, good initial conditions. And they've really had to be considered about how they save. Whereas some people have blown their opportunities out of the water and they don't know what they're doing anymore. It, it so finding a way to account for all of the financial situations you're going to need to overcome to become financially independent. That's the idea here. And I really don't have anything else to add after that. So, yeah, the only thing I would add to, to that is basically overlooking budgeting. is kind of like overlooking the life, your life's traje trajectory, basically. So you shouldn't have to work necessarily once you're in retirement age. The whole idea of retirement age is that you're just taking it easy. You put in your effort and now you've afforded yourself the, the luxury, the opportunity to rest and relax and focus on hopefully your nice, big, prosper, prosperous community, family, or whatever hobbies you may have. So just note that although there might be some delay of gratification in creating a budget, ultimately, if you're frugal and stick with it, it'll pay off in the future. So hopefully this gave people a little more uh, insight to particular examples and why we decided to talk about it today. But this has been a project Julie and I have been doing for the last couple of years and it's been great to be able to share these thoughts with you. So everybody, thanks again for watching and hopefully you got something to glean from all this. Yeah, thanks everyone.